Hello and welcome to An Academy, one stop destination for civil services aspirants in English medium. Welcome to today's The Hindu Newspaper Analysis, where we pick up today's The Delhi edition of newspaper for 1st of March. We analyze only those topics which are relevant for your examination. We pick up those articles, break it down for you and help you understand what is required to be studied and what is required to be extracted from those particular articles. Now before moving into those articles that we are going to discuss for today, a couple of announcements. First of all, about the fact that we are launching a seven days unlimited access and a free trial for the UPSC aspirants. So if you are interested in pursuing the preparation for civil services, please do go ahead and register on the app and you get a seven days uninterrupted access to all our offerings and all different courses and that will help you make a better decision how to proceed ahead further. Now, after that, the announcement regarding the special classes for today. So today, we had the 7 a.m. special class regarding the NCRT fundamentals. Then at 4 p.m., we have the special class for social justice about the analysis to right to education by Asta ma'am. And then at 7 p.m., under the portion of geography basics, we are going to initiate the discussion of mapping portion and the mapping module. So today we are going to initiate the discussion of world geography through the area of maps where we will be decluttering the different continents, their physical features and the economic realities thereby. Now, having said that, let us take a look at the topics that we are going to hold a discussion for today. So today in total, we are going to discuss seven topics in detail. Out of those, four can be thought to be relevant for your prelims preparation or rather the mains preparation. Even though from these also, prelims types of questions can be framed. We will discuss wherever that scope arises. Understanding the world of informal waste picker. This is an article which has appeared in the editorial page section and that is relevant for your GS paper 3. Then, should minimum support price be legalized? Now, this is an argument you have been hearing to and fro about for quite some time. So, this MSP is calculated on what basis, who calculates that and what is the ground reality? What are the issues and the obstacles that are faced thereby? So that is something which has appeared in page 11 in the form of an interview section. And that is something that we are going to emphasize and analyze furthermore. We are going to declutter that interview section in order to understand the pros and cons of the matter. This is also relevant and significantly important for your GS paper 3. On cross voting in Rajya Sabha elections, now about the cross voting which has happened very recently in the various different Raj Sabha elections, be it in Himachal Pradesh, be it in Karnataka and following that and following few of the other measures, few of the candidates from the assembly in Himachal Pradesh, they have been disqualified under different terms. So we are going to discuss about that as well. That has appeared in page 12, which is relevant for your GS paper too. Then is NATO membership in the cards for Ukraine? So that is again a portion in page 12 relevant for your IR or international relations module. Now for the prelims we are going to discuss three of the topics. So one of them is the cabinet nod for the 75,000 crore scheme of PM Surya Ghar. So that is the Muft Bijli Yojana that has appeared in page 15. Then there has been a substantial rise in the leopard population across the country. Now in which areas those rise have been experienced? In which areas there is a decline? Is there a larger trend that we have to take a note of? Then January core sector growth slows and the output rises. So with the help of this article, we will understand the realities of it. And then along with that, we are going to focus upon what is that core sector growth? What is the index of industrial production? So that is something that we are going to analyze for your prelims perspective. At the end of the entire discussion, we shall also be discussing about answer writing of two of the practice questions to understand how to frame the answers and what kind of questions can be expected from these topics. Now, without further ado, let us initiate the discussion with the first topic of the day. And the first topic is understanding the world of the informal waste sector and the informal waste picker. So today, 
that is 1st of March is the apt day when this article has been written and the apt day for this discussion to be held because the 1st of March marks the International Waste Pickers Day and this is after what happened in 1992 in Colombia where you had significant and substantial number of waste pickers who were fired upon leading to a death of close to around a dozen of these waste pickers. So the informal sector of waste pickers and rag pickers across the world, they are facing a conundrum, they are facing issues and difficulty in terms of the adaptation, in terms of when the newer legislations are coming into the place, the private players and the private sectors are entering into the waste sector, then what is there? to ensure that the rights, the social security network, everything is upheld and maintained for these rag pickers and these waste collectors. So that is the context in which the article has been written. Now, in your day to day life experience also, regardless of whichever part of the country you are living in, whenever you would venture out on the streets or whenever you would look out of the window, you would eventually find a soul or an individual rag picker or waste collector, right, who would carry large bags on their back and carry huge amount of waste that they segregate from the larger dumps which are there on the roadside, on the municipality regions, etc. Now these waste pickers, their condition is very worse, to put it in mild terms. Their real life condition is something that we cannot even begin to fathom. They don't exist when it comes to the social security networks of the government, the social schemes of the government, the various benefits that the government provides to the various different communities. For them, this sector is largely invisible. As a result of that, not only are they working in extremely hazardous circumstances, but also as a result of that, what is happening in terms of the exposure to various different health hazards, various different poor conditions, 10 to 8 hours of work day, collecting 60 to 80 kg of garbage. So they are exposed to some of the horrendous situations. And the reality of our society is also such that most of these individual waste collectors that you will find, these individual waste collectors, they consist of women and children in larger proportion. And most of them in our country, they belong to the socially and economically backward classes of the society. So that is why the amount of oppression that they face is oftentimes exacerbated. Now here, you might think that, okay, how many of these individual rag pickers or waste collectors do we have? And why is it that the government needs to have a separate planning for them? The answer is quite substantial. As per the labor force survey, which is released by the CSO. So as per that labor force survey, you had the aspect where it was found out that 1.5 million individual waste collectors were present in urban environment in our country. Out of that, 0.5 million were women. So the number is huge. Now, just to break the numbers of you uh, for you which has been sprayed across the entirety of the article if we talk about the numbers per se you will find out that the informal waste collection sector employs 0.5 to 2 percent of the urban population which is a good chunk we are talking about large numbers here especially in populated developing countries this oftentimes turns out to be a very huge number so there the problem faced by them becomes the problem of a larger mass. Then the periodic labor force survey released by the NSSO, now it has 1.5 million waste pickers in urban India. This is released by NSSO, National Sample Survey Organization and Office. So that collects the periodic labor force survey. Now the collection that they do every day 60 to 90 kg of waste is collected and overall they have a work span of 8 to 10 hours back breaking work 60 to 80 kg of waste we are not talking about small numbers here so cumulatively put it to this number 1.5 million 
of these workers on an average collecting 60 kg per day you can think about the millions and thousands of tons of waste that we rely upon for these collectors now it is these individual waste collectors who segregate the waste at the very basic level where the waste is disposed they when they segregate the waste after that they basically put some of these kind of waste materials such as plastics etc they put it to use by giving it and selling it to the industries and thereby helping in recycling of the waste as well so whenever you hear about the term about the circular economy in terms of waste disposal and waste management the entire concept that you study under the portion of integrated waste management what is the concept of integrated waste management very briefly waste management when you hear about it is not only about if i am uh, having some amount of waste in my household i am basically disposing it throwing it on the streets now that waste to be collected and then moved ahead and treated that is not the entire aspect of waste management integrated waste management talks about reducing the waste generated secondly recycling the waste that is generated reusing the components which can be reused for example metallic components metallic waste and so on right so the recycle reuse and reduce principle what is also referred to as the r3 principle in waste management terms the r3 okay so this r3 principle in waste management parlance that comes under the entire aspect of integrated waste management it also includes the aspects such as waste logistics that you need to have proper carrying systems for carrying the waste from your household to the eventual waste disposal and segregation sites so that entire aspect of waste management here an important cog in the wheel is that individual waste picker because across the world overall when we talk about let's suppose the plastic waste something that the entire world is facing an issue with the entire world is grappling with the issue of plastic waste in that situation imagine that 60% of the plastic waste across the globe 60% let that number sink in that huge amount of plastic waste is collected and the collection is attributed to these individual waste collectors so that is a huge number so here what should be the ideal aim the ideal aim should be that these individual waste pickers they should be guaranteed certain health benefits they the sector should be regulated a bit more minimum working conditions and minimum wage should be fixed in these areas but then that is not happening and what is happening actually is they are falling through that welfare net now when we talk about waste management legislations in our country various different waste management legislations have been brought about they have been amended the concept which has been promoted now and is being promoted across the world is the concept of extended producer responsibility now the article argues that under the new paradigm where this extended producer responsibility is the key word and is the methodology to go ahead these individual rag pickers are further basically moved away from the entire sector of waste management they are isolated why so what is this concept of epr as it is referred to so earlier and the conventional method of waste management would be what that let's suppose you have generated a plastic waste you have sipped a bottle of coca cola or any of the soft drinks that you like let's suppose pepsi anything now the plastic bottle that you have you throw it in the waste now thereby it is the job of the municipality in that area to collect that waste segregate that plastic bottle reuse recycle etc now here the entire principle stands in the argument that it is the job of the producer to take care of the waste how so basically if you understand the entire supply chain you will have a producer 
right of any of the item then that producer will sell it to the wholesaler okay he will sell it to the wholesaler the wholesaler will then sell it to the individual retailers right retailers to consumers etc that is how the entire chain operates they will sell it to retailers they will then eventually sell it to consumers and it is the consumers that is you and me who will dispose the waste okay the waste that is generated now let's think about a scenario where you or i we are very concerned about the environment we are very very responsible citizens to say the least we don't want to pollute the environment you go out there in the open and presently that the summer months are coming in let's suppose you want to have a sip of any of your favorite soft drinks or even a water bottle now you go to the shop you buy a water bottle it is there in the plastic container you drink that water now you are left with the plastic waste you have to throw it off so despite the fact that i am a very responsible citizen i will be disposing of and i will be generating some amount of that plastic waste but is it my fault no it is the producer who should have kept in mind the sustainable products to manufacture so if the producer is basically generating goods in the plastic bottles as consumers you and i we don't have much of a choice so when the waste is generated at the end of it then here who is going to be responsible for that waste it is the producers who have profited by generating those plastic bottles manufacturing in cheaper price right so this concept of epr holds the responsibility of waste generated and puts the onus on the producer itself so this entire concept shifts the onus and the responsibility of waste collection and waste segregation from the municipalities the authorities to the producers let's suppose another aspect you have the mobile phone manufacturers let's consider apple now apple manufactures huge amount of mobile phones now let's suppose when these mobile phones they stop working you will discard them and those electronic items consist of various different hazardous waste like lead mercury in certain cases and also some of the precious waste also but then are the authorities again going to take care of the electronic waste in particular do they have to devise a separate mechanism that is why you have the producers who have a target under the amended rules of the e waste management there is a fixed target that they are responsible for a collect back of this much amount of materials that they have produced they are the ones who have to treat them they have the one, they are the ones who have to reuse and recycle them now in this entire process the regulation and the monitoring as per the norms is carried out by the cpcb central pollution control board central pollution control board mind you is a statutory body established as per the provisions of the water act prevention of pollution act 1974 so that is the apex body when it comes to the management of waste and the pollution that is carried thereby so this cpcb is the nodal authority when it comes to overseeing how this epr work is carried on now the argument is that when you have these large organizations all the producers are very large organizations now when you have these large organizations in charge of waste management they will deploy the biggest of the machineries the most sophisticated and the complex of the robust robotic systems and in that entire process this individual waste collector they are marginalized their use is further reduced because now the authorities they are 
reducing their responsibility when it came, comes to waste management. So, it is a resultant of this EPR principle as well. Even though in the long run the EPR is good, EPR is the way to go forward. That is why even when you have the amendment to the plastic waste management rules, the solid waste management rules 2016, the amendment to the e-waste management rules, the EPR norms have been further strengthened. But then there is another aspect in the solid waste management rules 2016 that one has to keep in mind. As per the solid waste management rule 2016, if you consider solid waste management management rules 2016. Okay, so as per the rules of 2016, it is mandated that these individual rag pickers also have to be assimilated in the entire process of waste collection and their well-being also has to be ensured. The e-waste management rules amendment, they also talk about the fact that you need to carry out the upskilling of the people employed or deployed in the informal sector of waste collection and management. So, that is why going ahead what should be the future course of action will also always be the case where let us suppose these larger producers they are taking care or regulating the waste. Now, in that case, in that situation these larger producers they have to ensure that in that particular area howsoever numerous amount of individual rag pickers or waste collectors are there they are trained they are upskilled and thereby assuring them that some amount of meaningful living wage is earned. Okay? The government authorities also at the level of the municipalities, they should immediately go for the registration of these individual waste collectors so that a proper social security net can be provided to them. For example, health insurance. Now, many of these individual waste collectors, they work in the cases where they pick up metal sheets, discarded bottles, etc., leaving them with cuts and bruises and infections, which oftentimes claims lives. Now, it is very pertinent and important for us as a society to come behind in force behind these individual pickers and waste collectors. So, the municipal authorities need to register them, need to have a proper data regarding them and a scheme needs to be devised at the state level, at the grassroots level. Okay? Only then can we ensure a long-term benefit. So, what is it that this article talks about and what is it that we have studied in this article? First of all, what do we, what is the condition or the situation of the individual waste collectors in terms of numbers, their role in terms of waste management, the aspect of integrated waste management about the reduce, reuse and recycle. In that case, how important is the role of these waste collectors where they collect that much amount of garbage, segregate the waste, are responsible for collection of majority of the plastic garbage and thereby ensure that the world is a cleaner place but they are seeping through the welfare network or the welfare net because of lack of any policy. And in the case of the EPR, we have studied what is EPR, large organizations entering into the aspect of waste collection and waste management as a result of the EPR norms. Due to that, these individual workers, they are marginalized. And what is the way forward? these organizations need to incorporate amongst their workforce of waste management these informal workers and individual workers as well and the authorities also need to significantly carry out the work in order to understand and enumerate the informal workers in that area and provide a safety net okay now coming to the second article and that has appeared in page 11 of the newspaper and that is relevant for your GS paper 3. So, this has appeared in page 11. Okay. Now, should minimum support price be legalized? Now, that is what the entire debate is about, isn't it? 
ever since 2018 onwards and so on since farm distress first arose in the region of and the farm agitations first arose in the region of Maharashtra then further going ahead around 2020 when you had the farm agitations and presently again when the farm agitations are underway the common theme of the debate and the discussion is that one side argues that provide MSP the other side argues that we cannot provide MSPs both sides are backed with their own set of economists own set of agricultural scientists who can always argue both the pros and the cons so here this article is represented in the form of an interview format, but let us break it down. Minimum support price. For growing any crop, you do incur certain amount of expenses. Expenses in terms of the labor cost, expenses in terms of let's suppose buying the seeds, buying the fertilizers, all of that, the rent that you are paying on the land or the cost in which you have bought the land. So there is significant amount of input cost involved. Now let's suppose you have grown wheat. Now that wheat when you go to sell to the market, minimum support price is the price that is paid to you by when you are going to sell it. Now that minimum support price should ideally consist of the entire cost that you have incurred and some additional amount as well. So that it is remunerative for a farmer to carry out the process of farming and cultivation, right? That is the entire principle or the concept. Presently, MSP is provided on a set of 23 food grains. And that MSP which is provided is relevant, is required for the well-being of the farming community. But the Shanta Kumar committee in its recommendation and its findings had reported that only around 6% of the farmers across the country, they are actually getting the price of MSP. The remaining of the farmers, 94% of the farmers of the country, and this is the historical data taken from 1960s onwards. So the remainder of the farmers of the country, they get paid at the value of the international prices or a price lower than the MSP. Now that is where the clamor call has been raised that make this MSP a legal provision so that everybody gets paid at this MSP only. Now this MSP presently is being exercised and the farmers who are benefiting from this MSP are largely from the northwestern green revolution states of the country that is Punjab, Haryana and the western UP area. In the remaining portions of the country, the market system, the mandi systems are not so well developed and not so well entrenched. That is why the people get or the farmers get lower prices. So here, first of all, on what basis is the price calculated and who calculates the price? So MSP is finalized by the recommendations given by the CACP. Okay, so it is a cabinet uh, which finalizes the MSP after looking at the recommendations of the CACP. Now, here three va various different formulae or parameters are used in order to talk about and come to the decision of what should be the MSP. So, let us take a look at it. First of all, it is A2. What is A2? A2 is cost incurred by the farmer in the production of a particular crop which include that is the input cost, expenditure on seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, leased in land, the lease that you are paying to the land, hired labor, machinery and fuel. That aggregate is considered to be A2. Then you have A2 plus FL. FL talks about the value of family labor. Let's suppose in a farmer community or in any particular farming family, you have 10 members in the family. All of them directly or indirectly are deployed on the farmland. Ideally, they are carrying out the labor. They should be remunerated for the labor that they are doing, isn't it? So that is the FL portion. Now, after taking a look at the A2 and FL, that is where the term C2 is arrived at. So C2 is basically the A2 plus FL plus the rental value of the own land plus interest on fixed capital 
rent paid for the lease, the land value in general. Okay, so this is the C2. Keep in mind A2, FL, and C2. A2 again for quick revision. A2 is the farm input cost. Seeds value, the value of the machinery, the, few, the tractor, fuel, fertilizer, pesticide, that is A2. FL talks about family labor. C2 is A2 plus FL plus the rent that you are paying for the land, the amount of money that you are paying as the interest to the capital borrowed, all that is computed when you are calculating the C2. Now, as per the Swaminathan Committee's recommendation, the National Commission of Farmers, what was referred to as the Swaminathan Commission, it recommended that the MSP should be at least 50% more than the cost of production. And cost of production basically is the C2 cost. So ideally, as per the Swaminathan Committee recommendation, you had the MSP, the value or the formula for MSP was designated as the cost of production, right? So that comes out to be C2 plus 50 percent. Okay, that should be the MSP, ideally. But here I have attached a table also to show you that this is about last year for the month of October when the government announced a set of MSP for certain crops. Observe that C2 is mentioned for wheat, barley, gram, lentils, safflower, rapeseed, mustard. Now, MSP which should be there according to C2 plus 50. So for wheat, it should be 2478. The MSP declared by the government is 2275 per quintal. It is less than what the recommendations stand for. Then, when it comes to barley, 2421, it is the MSP announced is only 1850. Then, as per the MSP of gram, here it should be 6820. The MSP announced is only 5440. So, what you observe as a trend is the fact that this C2 plus 50 percent formula is not applicable, is not rather applied by the government when it announces the MSP. The argument on the side of the government is that, look, we are taking the weighted cost across the entirety of the country and taking the average of it. The argument on the counter side is, even if whatever you are doing, at least maintain the C2 plus 50 percent. That is not maintained. And many of the farmers are not even paid this price. Which means what? Which means that the farm income is reducing. As the farm income is reducing, farm impoverishment is on the anvil. There are going to be farm agitations today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, one year from now, five years from now. Farm agitations are going to be consistent. So what is the way forward here? Let us understand that. Right. But before that, the argument in favor or against the MSP, most of you would be well versed with that by now. You have to understand that there is also a limited capacity on the side of the government. No particular state government, no particular central government can actually or do they have the um, amount of resources required to buy all the grains from across the country at the MSP price. They don't have that much amount of resources, period. Right? Now, the argument on the other side can be that the government is spending so much on money, of money on other things. Why can't they use that money for providing MSP? But still, the expenditure that you carry in various different heads, that is limited, that is restricted. Right? So, you have to maintain the overall deficit figures. You cannot allow the deficit to simply run away. In the case of the states who have ensured that all the products are bought at MSP, if you take a look at the deficit figures, they are huge. State like Punjab, for example, has got its finances in the state which is worse than that of Sri Lanka. 
completely dependent on the central government's resources in order to carry out the various different schemes. So that is where there is a limitation. But on the other side, you cannot be blind to the, f to the distress that the agricultural community has been facing for the past three to four decades now due to falling prices. The wages for the labor in various other sectors, they have been rising. But in the agricultural area, it has been consistent or declining. When you uh, put that and juxtapose that figure along with the inflation, you will find the condition of agricultural impoverishment in front of us. So what should be the way forward? The way forward is what you have to concentrate upon. First is crop diversification. Understand one aspect. MSP is being provided for the food grains. MSP is not provided for, let's suppose, the fruits and the vegetables. Here, there is a point which is made by the farmers and the milk producers as well. And the farmers of the horticultural crops who are growing vegetables. If, let's suppose, you legalize the MSP for these 23 grains, what stops the other farmers from demanding that what is our fault? Why shouldn't the cauliflower and the cabbage that we grow, that should also be grow, uh, sold at a uh, fix an MSP for that? So will a government in power or any government, whosoever comes to power, will the task of the government be to decide the price of all the agricultural products? Im imagine the amount of regulation that needs to be imposed in order to fructify that. And you have cases of the milk sector. Milk sector has seen a substantial amount of uptake in our country. From a situation a few decades back where as a country we did not have enough amount of milk and milk product output to feed ourselves, now we have become the, one of the largest milk producers and milk product producers across the world. Now that success in the milk sector has happened, is it because there is an MSP for milk? No, it has happened because there are formation of cooperatives. Cooperatives mean, let's suppose you have an individual farmer who has grown something. He has gone to the market to sell that product, maybe two quintals. He will be negotiated a price and then he would be given that price, lower price. But let's suppose you have a group or a cohort of farmers who come together in a particular area. They collect all their output. Together they have produced individual, one had produced only two quintal. Let's suppose together they have managed to produce five tons. Who will have a better bargaining power? The group, the cohort, they will have a better bargaining power that, okay, for these five tons, I need this much amount of price. Now in that case, what will happen? Individual farmers will also benefit. And when you have such cooperatives, pooling of such large group of farmers, then automatically the input cost will also be shared. Maybe they will deploy one large thrasher and harvester which multiple farmers can use. So the productivity of the farmland can also increase. Overall input cost can decrease. The bargaining price in the market will improve. The ability to sell to the larger private sector will improve. They can form a larger export grouping as well. So there are significant upsides to it. Also understand, the area in our agricultural sector which is consistently for the past few years indicating almost a double digit or a high single digit growth is not that of food grains. Please don't get into the misconception that wheat and rice production is the one which is taking the agricultural production and the agricultural growth rate of 2 to 3 percent. No. The sector in the Indian agricultural setup which is growing the fastest is the poultry, the fisheries and the animal husbandry sector. Now in these sectors, is there an MSP provided? No. Again, you have the well-functioning cooperatives in the poultry sector that is doing well. So that tells you that in this market model, something is working. 
for certain group of producers some model is working and that model is what the model of cooperatives get together that is why the government in the previous years also the governments in power they have basically encouraged the formation of cooperatives in the farm sector now the failure of uh, for doing that led to the mooting of the idea for the farm producer organizations or FPOs various tax benefits rebates etc have been provided to them that is a way forward going ahead to reduce the input cost per head and improve the overall production right now mixed farming should be promoted at the individual level India has got one of the highest population of livestock anywhere across the world now that provides you significant scope to carry out mixed farming now in that process of mixed farming what is mixed farming mixed farming is crop cultivation plus animal husbandry so let's suppose you are growing crops in the farmland some amount of straws etc you use to feed the poultry in your uh, area you sell the poultry earn some income so that mixed farming diversifies your source of income crop diversification go to the high value crops vegetables mixed farming go for income substitution and income diversification then consistency in pricing of msp on the side of the government the government should ensure that minimum of c2 plus 50 percent of the cost is covered under any condition that msp at least the declared price that you are releasing that should be consisting of c2 plus 50 percent period and that has to be maintained okay if you have declared a price of okay 2500 is the msp most of the farmers even who are not fetching the price at msp they will also get 2200 minimum but if you are declaring the price at 2000 which is much lesser than c2 plus 50 percent the farmers in areas such as many portions of central india eastern india they they get the price of 1500 1400 so that is where exploitation happens so this should be fixed but these systemic changes need to be made storage structures need to be built and these reforms are required if we need the agricultural sector which does employ around 45 percent of our population that agricultural sector if it has to do well has to go for these kind of reforms okay so in this article a quick recap about what we have studied what is that argument of msp for and against what is that minimum support price on what basis is it calculated what is a2 a2 is the input cost the cost of the seed the cost of the fertilizer the cost of the insecticides pesticides etc that is a2 fl is what fl is the family labor and then you have a2 plus fl that comes out to be c2 plus the rental cost the interest paid on the capital etc that is c2 the Swaminathan Commission basically or the National Commission of Farmers that declared or that advised the government to come up with C2 plus 50 percent as the formula for MSP. The government is not doing that. That requires to be done and the other mechanisms what can be done to improve the farm sector and get rid of the impoverishment in the farmlands. Okay. Then moving to the third article. And that is on cross voting in Rajya Sabha elections. Now you would have heard in the news stories as well that the recently conducted Rajya Sabha elections in various different states, they were full of cross voting cases and instances in various different states, be it Himachal Pradesh, be it Karnataka, be it in Uttar Pradesh, etc. Cross voting has happened. Now, what are these Rajya Sabha elections? So the elections for Rajya Sabha, they are held in an indirect manner. You and I, we don't elect the representatives for the upper house or the Rajya Sabha. For Rajya Sabha, the election is done in the respective state legislatures. Now, depending upon the population of that state legislature, the amount of seats that the state will have 
for that Rajya Sabha that is dependent. So, that is why it is also referred to as the Rajya Sabha is referred to as the Council of States. It is the these are the representatives for the various different states. Now, as I told you, the number of seats that a state has is dependent on the population of that state and the size of that state. So, a state like Uttar Pradesh will have more number of seats, much more number of seats than a state like Goa, which will have one seat for Rajya Sabha. Now, the parties in the legislative assembly, they nominate that these are the members and these will basically run the elections for Rajya Sabha. Earlier, what used to be the case and the norm would be that the parties in power or the parties in opposition, they had their respective number of seats and based on that seats, they would say that, okay, one candidate we elect, one candidate this party will elect and the election to Rajya Sabha largely used to be unopposed up till 1998. In 1998, for the election of Rajya Sabha in Maharashtra, there was an instance of cross voting. And as a result of that, the Congress candidate lost the election. Now, the government which came into power at the central level, they basically amended the Section 59 of Representation of People Act 1951. That amendment was done in 2003. The 2003 amendment was done, right? So, the 2003 amendment to the Section 59 of the Representations of People Act 1951. This was done and under this amendment changes were made. Earlier, the voting used to be the secret voting. Well, let's suppose if I am the member of Legislative Assembly, I have my ballot paper. In that, I will mark it out. I will secretly vote it. But then when instances of this cross voting came, that is when the Representations of People's Act was amended and thereby the open ballot system came into existence. Now, what is that open ballot system? Under this, let's suppose the ballot paper that you have, you mark out the name of the representative, etc. Now, you have to show that ballot paper to the party representative and then go to cast the vote. Right? So, that is a next level of transparency. Now, this amendment, by the way, was the one which paved way for what is a norm that we see nowadays, that even if, let's suppose, you are not a member or not a voter of a particular state, still you can be elected for Rajya Sabha from that state. What it means, let's suppose I am an individual who is not from Uttar Pradesh. Let's suppose I belong from Karnataka. But the Uttar Pradesh Legislative Assembly can elect me as their representative to the Rajya Sabha. This was the amendment which eventually paved way for Dr. Manmohan Singh to be sent to Rajya Sabha from the state of Assam. Dr. Manmohan Singh was a member of the Rajya Sabha and not the Lok, Lok Sabha. Right? So, this was the major amendment which was brought in. Now, this gave rise to significant amount of uh, discomfort in smaller states, for example. And something which has been apparent in the recently conducted Himachal Pradesh Rajya Sabha election. In the Himachal Pradesh Rajya Sabha election, because of which the entire article is in debate and discussion, in that particular election, Congress fielded Abhishek Manu Singhvi, who is not from Himachal Pradesh. And that possibly has irked a lot of people in that area that an outsider we are not going to favor. Now, this is done by all the political parties. It is not to say that only one political party has done that. All political parties do that. Just the fact that many of the Legislative Assembly members, MLAs in the Himachal Pradesh Assembly, they have said that this is a reason for them cross-voting. Now, this amendment was challenged in the Supreme Court. And under the judgment of the very famous case Kuldeep Nair versus Union of India 2006, Supreme Court upheld this amendment and Supreme Court said that, look, secrecy of ballot paper, if that is leading to cross-voting and corruption, 
because under the table the allegation was that huge amount of money is changing hands under the table in order to have the voting inclined in certain direction because it is secret ballot. The Supreme Court held that if secrecy is leading to corruption, transparency can lift the veil over it. Transparency in the ballot is the way forward. Now it has got its own drawback, it has got its own lacunae in the sense that let's suppose I am an, a member of a political party. Let's suppose now my political party has basically nominated this individual X but as a member I don't like X, I don't like X's principles etc or I simply don't like the face of X. Now for me under the democratic setup if I am electing someone I should have the freedom to not vote for that individual. Now under the provisions of article 19 1a this was challenged that if you are showing or you are imposing that open ballot system that means in a way you are curbing my right to expression. So that is when the Supreme Court also mentioned that look if you are cross voting that does not amount to going against the party's wishes in the legislative business. So many of the parties they started kicking out the members whoever cross voted in the Rajya Sabha election under the 10th schedule. What is that 10th schedule? The 10th schedule which was provided as per the 52nd constitutional amendment act 1985 talks about defection and the famous anti-defection law. So the 10th schedule provides that a member of parliament or state legislature who voluntarily gives up membership of their party or votes against the instruction of a party in a house is liable for disqualification from the house. Voluntarily gives up membership of their party. Now, voluntarily, why will I give up the membership of, a, of my party? I can keep on cross voting against my candidate. I will not give up the membership of the party. So the judgment of the Supreme Court goes here as well. And the Supreme Court in the judgment when we talk about the Ravi S. Nayak and Sanjay Bhandarkar versus Union of India. In that particular judgment, the Supreme Court opined that going voluntarily giving up the membership of the party does not only amount to the house proceedings. It can amount to individual behavior. It can amount to your actions outside the house also. But here, the party whip issues the direction for the legislative business. Let's suppose a bill is to be passed. The whip of the party uh, is issued that look, today you have to be present in the assembly and you have to vote in yes or no. All the members have to follow the whip. If you don't follow the whip, that surmounts to going against the party and voting against the instruction of the party. So if a whip is issued, thereby if you still vote against the party, that means you are liable for disqualification under the anti-defection law. But then, why is it that cross voting in Rajya Sabha does not attract disqualification? That is because the entire voting process for Rajya Sabha is not considered as a legislative business in the assembly. Passage of bills, they are considered to be a part of legislative business, right? Voting for the bills, etc. They are considered to be a part of legislative business. But voting for Rajya Sabha is not considered to be a part of the legislative business. That means they are exempt from being disqualified as per the anti-defection law. But in Himachal Pradesh, there we have witnessed that members of the Congress party, 
they have been disqualified from the legislative assembly now why have been have they been disqualified so they have not been disqualified for cross voting in rajya sabha these members who cross voted they were summoned and uh, in the legislative assembly and a whip was issued that for the finance bill the budget in the budget session you have to vote in favor of the government these members they did not show up so it is there where their failure to vote in favor of the finance bill and the state budget for that and they defied the chief whip of the party that puts them under the condition for disqualification so the disqualification of the mlas which has happened in the himachal assembly has not happened because of the rajya sabha cross voting but has happened because of their subsequent failure to vote in the favor of the government in the finance bill so that is the distinction now what is the way forward going ahead everywhere we are experiencing cross voting that puts the entire election process under shambles and under speculative eye now supreme court made a departure from normal by restoring the chandigarh mayoral elections similarly the article argues that the court should start picking out these materials and these cases suo moto and they should pass landmark judgments set examples so that these are not repeated going ahead into the future so that the election to rajya sabha that is significantly free of discretion there are various different abnormal rules for example in the ballot paper you have to use the violet pen only in order to mark the ballot paper in the haryana rajya sabha election few years back significant number of members from the congress party they were disqualified because they use other color pen so the ballot papers were discarded so the supreme court needs to take one of these cases to a motu and then come out with the ruling which will eventually pave the way for future course of rajya sabha elections as well okay now is nato membership in the cards for ukraine now this is a part of the series of articles which have come up uh marking the 2 year anniversary of the russia ukraine war so here nato membership right now north atlantic treaty organization or nato is a post second world war or a cold war legacy where you had competing superpowers of ussr and united states forming their own security setup their own defense organizations now while the ussr that put up the warsaw pact here the us put up nato inclusive of countries of north america western europe etc so ussr or russia since the time of the soviet days has always been skeptical about the intentions of nato it has never looked at it in positive light now nato has consistently tried to expand its presence across the globe now there nato in 2008 announced that we will incorporate georgia as well as ukraine into nato membership russia saw it as an open threat russia saw it that now the nato will install missiles etc right at the border of russia that virtually limits russia's strategic power significantly in the region of europe Russia saw it as a restrictive move. Immediately following that, you had Vladimir Putin-led Russian government. They launched an attack on Georgia, and Georgia fell within a few weeks. Now, in 2014, the same exercise was carried out in Ukraine. Accession of the Crimean Peninsula, where you have the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Navy. Now, Crimea. was annexed by russia furthermore as ukraine sped up the process for accession into nato thereby and the membership into nato to use the correct terminology russia saw it as an open threat again and that was the reason why 
on 24th of February 2022, the Russian forces marched into Ukraine to start a war which is still ongoing, which has claimed thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands of lives on both sides. As per certain intelligence reports, the Russian armed forces have lost more than 2 lakh individuals in this attack. Now, as this attack is ongoing, there are murmurs and Ukraine basically is pleading to the NATO that please make us a part of your organization. Why is Ukraine still pleading for that? Because even if today Ukraine is made a part of, U of NATO, there will be automatic triggering of Article 5 of the NATO norms. And Article 5 of the NATO norms say that if there is any attack on any of the member nations, it will be taken as a cumulative attack on NATO and then the NATO can respond. The entire alliance can respond. So, Ukraine has been pleading for that membership. But NATO is wary of providing that membership till now. Why? Because that would mean an open confrontation with Russia and closing all the doors for negotiation and a way forward with the Russians. Now, what is the present scenario? The present scenario is such that when we talk about the support to the Ukrainian forces, the Western world is already divided. For example, when we talk about the US, US doesn't have a bipartisan support for this war. For example, the Republicans, represented by Donald Trump, argues that we are wasting our resources giving it to Ukraine. Other countries should give more resources to Ukraine. Germany, on the other hand, is arguing that all of you are talking about this much amount of fund we are giving to Ukraine. We are giving arms and ammunition. You should include that in the fund. You have the other members of European community who are arguing that this fund that you have set for Ukraine should be used for developing all our defense forces in order to face against the Russian danger in future. But while all this argument and counter argument is happening, one by one, the cities of Ukraine are falling. People are dying. Right? So what is the way forward? Dialogue. Dialogue and dialogue something that India has been promoting for quite some time. India has been advocating that, that mediation and dialogue, they are the only way forward in this entire game. So that is the way forward going ahead. And here, NATO membership, that needs to be very significantly weighted upon. You have to weigh in all the pros and the cons before providing that NATO membership. Okay, and the Ukrainian support which is provided to the region of Ukraine, that needs to be humanitarian as urgently as possible. Okay, now, then coming to a few of the articles relevant for your prelims. So the first article is Cabinet OK 75,000 crore free electricity solar scheme. Now this particular scheme which has been named as the PM Surya Ghar Muft Bijli Yojana that scheme is to promote the rooftop solar okay it is to promote rooftop solar what do we mean by rooftop solar so rooftop solar energy basically refers to the installation of solar generating cells okay the solar cells on the individual roofs so that you can have decentralization of electricity production. And that decentralization of electricity production will lead to self-sufficiency, energy security, and eventually people can also earn from it. How? Let's suppose from on the top of your household, you have installed a solar or you have had a solar installation of one kilowatt or two kilowatt power. Now that one kilowatt or two kilowatt what you have installed, maybe you don't use all of it. You send something back to the grid and when you sell it back to the grid, you will earn income from that. So as per this provision, the government is going to provide subsidy 
and subsidized installation of rooftop solar with the help of the public sector undertakings in the sector. Now there the subsidy is going to be provided only for the lower rating installations not for the industrialized sector that is the you have a subsidy which is announced up till around 2 to 3 kilowatts of installation okay so it will be carried out by the public sector undertakings in the region in this particular sector it is a subsidy for installation of rooftop solar it can also lead to income generation at the household level by the individual families being able to sell that excess solar generated back to the grid so it is an income generation program also as is being touted by the central government okay so here 60 percent of under the subsidy 60 percent of the cost for installing two kilowatt systems 40 percent of the cost will be covered for the systems of two to three kilowatt that turns out to be a some amount of rupees 30,000 as subsidy for 1 kilowatt, 60,000 as subsidy for 2 kilowatt, 78,000 as subsidy for 3 kilowatt. Okay, so that is the subsidy which is announced. Now, the second article India's leopard population rises to 13,874. 13,874 that has been a rise in the leopard population. Now, this is a survey which has been carried out in 20 states of the country and then these numbers have been arrived at. These numbers indicate that the leopard population is largely stable. But lack of enough data in the past also exposes us to a reality that it might be the case that the leopard population is not increasing at the rate as it should. It is absolutely restricted but here when we talk about the leopard and its habitats it has got its various habitats in the region of the shivaliks for example okay in the region of shivaliks so other than the shivaliks you have the region of the northeastern states the region of the western ghats central and southern india these are the various different areas in which you will find that leopard population. Now, in the region, for example, in Uttarakhand, and listen to this carefully. In Uttarakhand, in certain areas, there has been a marked decline in leopard population. And in certain areas, those are converging with an increase in the tiger population. Mostly, when you consider the distribution of population of leopards, they do coincide and converge with areas of tiger population and the tiger reserves. But other than that, because le leopards are able to adapt more ably well, they are to be found in the suburbs, in the township and the cities as well. Now, because their population is widespread in the suburbs, townships and the cities, they prey on cattle the cattle which is kept untended. Now that leads to frequent man-animal conflict. You would come across frequent news stories that a leopard sighting has been done in this particular city in Mumbai, in Bangalore, in the outskirts and there people have managed to kill, people have managed to capture etc. So due to this rising man-animal conflict, the population is slightly threatened. Now also, there is an increased competition with the tiger population, tiger being an apex predator. So, the amount of prey in an area that is restricted for the leopard. That is why in certain areas of Uttarakhand, there has been a marked increase in the tiger population and subsequently a decline in the leopard population in the same area. Right. So, that basically holds the argument that because the amount of prey in these reserved areas that is going down because of increase in the tiger population, leopards are moving towards cities, increasing the man-animal conflict. However, the green shoots are also present. For example, leopard population in the northeastern states, in the region of Bengal and northeastern states, they have shown a massive uptick. In Uttar Pradesh, both tiger and leopard populations have increased. Now, that is a resultant what is attributed to the fact that in the previous data and the previous survey which was done, 
huge amount of these camera trap methods of capturing the leopards that was not deployed. So maybe our previous data that is not as accurate as we think it to be. Okay? But here what is the way forward? We need to be monitoring the leopard population, the prey, the herbivores on which the leopard prey, uh, feeds itself, the tigers feed themselves, their population needs to be adequate in the forested areas so that they don't venture out. The areas under natural vegetation invariably have to be increased. Under the National Forest Policy of 1988, India envisages an overall 33% of its geographical area to be under forest. We need to achieve that. If we are able to achieve that, we will reduce the frequent man-animal conflict and thereby further be able to reduce the threat to the leopard population as well. Okay? Now, the last article, January core sector growth slows to 15-month low, output at a 10-month high. Now, this might seem to be contradicting in nature, but if you think about it, the core sector growth has shown a 15-month low here because the core sector as compared to last or last time, year earlier, that has got a high base effect. Last year, January, the growth was 9.7%. So, in order to grow on top of that, you need to have a very high growth. Here, the growth has moderated. The core sector growth basically is still at 3.6%. It is not as if the core sector growth is very less. It is still at 3.6%. Okay. But there has been a marked fall in the fertilizer sector, in the fertilizer manufacturing, due to which the growth prospects have reduced. Okay? But still, if you consider the overall output generated by the economy, it is still growing higher up. It is still at around a 10-month high, rising consecutively for the second month in the row. That is, December also marked a rise in the overall output, right? And January also. From here, First of all, what is core sector growth? Core sector growth is something that you always hear about. Now, core sector represents some of the very key areas of the economy whose development marks the idea or reflects the economic growth in the industrial sector. That is why core sector growth consisting of areas such as steel, cement, etc., they occupy 40% proportion in the index of industrial production. So here if you take a look at it, so you have eight core industries that is coal, natural gas, crude oil, refinery products, fertilizer, cement, steel and electricity. All of them they are included in the core sector. This becomes relevant for your prelims which are the sectors included in the core industries. They comprise 40% in the overall index of industrial production. What is this index of industrial production? So the index of industrial production is an index released by the Central Statistical Organization on a monthly basis which indicates the overall growth parameter in the industry. It computes basically broad sectors namely mining, manufacturing, electricity, the core sector and use based, the consumer based sectors that is basic goods, capital goods, intermediate goods. So both of these are computed to come to the index of industrial production. The base year is computed to be 2004 and 2005. It is an indicator that measures the growth rate of industry groups. Okay? So, that is a very real indicator and reflection of how the economy is functioning, how the economy is doing under any scenario. So, that is about the IIP and that is about the core sector. Okay? So, the core sector growth this time has slowed down. You don't need to remember the figures and the data point at all. You need to know the eight sectors in that in a core sector, the eight groups. You need to understand why that has been decreasing because of slowdown in the fertilizer production. That is why it has basically decreased.
okay let us take a look at the practice questions what is the concept of extended producer responsibility in terms of the solid waste management discuss the impact on informal industry and the way forward so here very simple in the introduction itself you can start by writing that extended producer responsibility is the principle of putting the onus of waste management on the producers rather than the authorities now this is in order to promote or this principle is followed in order to promote sustainable and responsible production usage of sustainable materials and able waste handling that is your introduction then talk about the fact that the solid waste management rules the plastic waste management rules and the e-waste management rules along with the biomedical waste management rules all of them have specified epr as a key pillar in their entire methodology of waste management segregation disposal now under these epr norms the producers are given the onus or the responsibility to tackle xyz amount of waste which is generated and that target means that the producers they have deployed larger firms deploying sophisticated machinery etc in the entire aspect of waste management the informal waste collectors who represent 1.5 million of the urban population in our country already in the marginalized areas of the society they are the worst hit why because of their marginalization or lack of employment or lack of role in that new setup that is something that you can highlight other than that you have to highlight the fact about the way forward so the authorities should enumerate them the producers should enumerate them in terms of waste management they should be provided social and safety security net etc okay now providing guaranteed msp for the agricultural sector is the panacea to farm distress in india analyze now you have to put the argument both in favor and against very briefly you talk about the msp talk about the a2 plus fl formula c2 plus 50 percent should be the msp now there talk about the fact that msp is declared for the 23 food grains but some of the best performing sectors of indian agriculture namely the milk poultry fisheries they don't have or they don't fall under the net of msp right talk about the arguments in favor of msp it will get rid of the farm impoverishment it will provide the amount of price assured income for the farmers and the argument against also you can and in the argument favor you also talk about that 45 percent of our population is involved in agriculture and impoverishment of them means the impoverishment of the economy rising inequality argument against government doesn't have enough resources if the government buys all of it it doesn't have enough storage spaces what is the way forward eventually crop diversification formation of cooperatives mixed farming fixing of msp at the c2 plus 50 percent impose it and implementation of it across the country that is how you can basically finish the answer do try to practice this answer writing practice will eventually make you better in this so that is where we mark the end of this session if you have liked this analysis video please don't forget to click on the like share and the subscribe button till we meet again take care of yourself goodbye thank you